So I hope it's not going to be a killer presentation here. So I have five uh, topics I'm going to cover, and uh, most of them I've been working, uh, I mean, four of them I've been working directly on it. Uh, there is a second one uh, which I want to promote here. It's work done by a colleague of mine, Amazon AI, together with a student this summer. And I like it uh, also in considering your interest in low resource uh, uh, machine translation. So there are nice tips about uh, uh, the use of transformer models. So uh, let me go directly uh, on the first one, uh, the coolant model from uh, and see from which uh, morphology. This is joint work with uh, my PhD students uh, in Trento. Uh, and these are the two reference papers. So if I go quickly through, I mean, the main concept of morphology is the way words are uh, built, okay? That you can split into components, which include, uh, which are called morphemes, which can include stuff like uh, roots uh, and uh, which be a meaning of the word and suffixes, uh, uh, prefixes, in general called affixes, which uh, uh, convey uh, grammatical, syntactical, and uh, even sometimes uh, uh, semantic meaning, uh, additional meaning. And uh, if you look about languages, languages might have different uh, uh, types of morphology uh, features. So we have isolating languages, and uh, they are characterized by one word, one morpheme. So they are called analytic for this reason. And here we have an example in Thai. Uh, very uh, easy to isolate morphological uh, morphemes there. Uh, but many languages are called synthetic, and you have two kinds of synthetic languages uh, characterized by the fact that one word can contain multiple morphemes. And uh, you might have uh, so-called uh, fusional uh, languages in which uh, single uh, morpheme can carry multiple uh, uh, features, multiple information. Like you see the uh, highlighted uh, morpheme uh, all the there, the years information like uh, uh, accusative, singular, neuter, uh, gender. So, and um, and you have uh, agglutinative languages like Turkish, in which very long words, but each morpheme in the word is either a root or uh, uh, an affix, which gives exactly one uh, role. Uh, so most of the times, of course, there are exceptions. So again, here it's easy to isolate single uh, components. Uh, they are not mixed, but uh, so this is a language which has a uh, it's called rich morphology because the words bear many morphological information and semantic information as well. So rich uh, morphology uh, or higher morphological complexity means in general more surface forms, so more uh, different larger vocabularies, more, more uh, types or word types that you can observe. And word types from a statistical perspective, when you collect statistics from corpora means in general uh, increased data sparseness. So you have large vocabulary and uh, uh, data sparseness, so um, uh, an even distribution of observations over uh, tokens, and, and often a very long tail, I mean, of uh, uh, types which uh, low number of observations. I mean, this can have impact in, uh, in uh, machine translation. Here is a very conventional, uh, maybe old-fashioned uh, architecture uh, of encoder-decoder. So you have an encoder here, and you have a decoder in general uh, uh, at the, in the first layer, you have this embedding layer. Um, and you have usually a fixed number of these uh, embeddings uh, that you use to represent uh, words. And uh, in general, embeddings, in order to be uh, uh, useful, uh, have to be trained on uh, enough number of observations. So you cannot train uh, these uh, word vectors from very few observations. You need to see many examples. And, uh, and again, on the, on the output, you have this softmax operator from which you sample uh, translations, uh, um, uh, word translations um, in the target language. And, uh, and softmax is a, can be an expensive operation. So even thinking of uh, allowing many, many uh, uh, word types 
on the output can be a problem in terms of efficiency because of the complexity uh, of the soft multiplication. Uh, there is, a, uh, of course, a solution. People thought about this, which is by pair encoding. And uh, here the hypothesis is that you create subwork. So you split work based on the frequency, and, uh, and then you perform translation of the subwork. Uh, and and you, you can make it more efficient even by sharing subwork uh, across the source and target language. Uh, and in the original paper by, by Rico, uh, they showed that it can uh, nicely manage auto-recovery work, of course, assuming that they are built by uh, subwork uh, from other work and, uh, and uh, uh, loan words as well and uh, named entities. Um, but the point is that uh, do things work also for rich morphology languages like, like Turkish. So we, we see some issues uh, uh, with, with the vector encoding. So in general, uh, solely relying on frequency does not guarantee that you can produce compact and efficient vocabulary. So here's German on the right. So you see that for the reason that these uh, words are frequent, they are left uh, um, intact. So you have entries which overlap quite a lot, you know, and uh, probably this isn't, it's not the most efficient way to organize vocabulary. Uh, all these words share the same roots, which is not small, but maybe uh, could be more efficient to uh, split them in uh, these two. There is a more annoying uh, problem, which is uh, that segmentation of BP can break uh, the word structure in a way that it uh, uh, um, damages the, the meaning of the word. So uh, th these are examples from uh, Turkish in which uh, BP generates subwords which uh, completely diverge from the original meaning. So in the first one, the, the, the root low is... Uh, um, broken and is uh, it's converted into uh, into blood, okay? So that MT makes mistakes at that point. Instead of uh, translating in the law, uh, that word in that some context, it's translated into blood. And the reason is exactly because BPE basically uh, merged two uh, subwords which shouldn't have been merged, okay? Uh, because they, they correspond to different, completely different roots. And probably maybe blood is much more frequent, one meaning prevails over the other. Uh, this is the most important part. So what we thought about coping with this issue was to get rid of this pre-processing uh, uh, with BPE that create uh, uh, a new uh, vocabulary, which in, let me say is not really optimized for the task for machine translation. And, and think about uh, uh, allowing the network to learn uh, directly uh, representations for the word without uh, using uh, artificial uh, segmentation. And, uh, and the idea is basically you have a way to map uh, uh, graphemic units into lexical units through a, a recurrent network, okay? So we start from really simple input units uh, grapheme, which of course for phonetic languages can be really close map to, to elementary sound uh, called phonemes and, uh, and uh, encode basically the sequence of, uh, of uh, these uh, units uh, into a uh, uh, word uh, representation uh, through bidirectional uh, recurrent maps. Okay? And uh, we do this simply with uh, GRUs, and uh, we create a unique representation at the end, which is substantially uh, uh, the, the um, composition of the uh, most, uh, the leftmost um, and rightmost states of this bidirectional um, uh, GRU um, network, and. Uh, um, and do this basically via a combination between the two. And, uh, and the parameters of this network are optimized uh, for machine translation, of course. So this component here is embedded into uh, an MT system. 
and uh, so really can be independent from uh, uh, the architecture that you're using. So we worked with recurrent neural nets historically, uh, and, but it could be used for the transformers as well. Uh, notice that in terms of processing, uh, some parallels can be, of course, uh, applied because if you have all the world to input world, the, the processing for all these uh, recurrent neural nets, the first layer can be done in parallel. So these networks can run in parallel with that. So uh, we uh, evaluated this approach over uh, several languages, which uh, show different types of uh, morphology. So templatic for Arabic, uh, um, fusional, partial agglutinative for Czech, fusional for German and Italian, and agglutinative for French. So to have a variety of uh, um, languages. And we run experiments in a low resource setting. So TED talks. Uh, which give about 100, between 130,000 and 250,000 parallel sentences uh, per direction. So uh, I go <coughs> quickly through this table, which covers many approaches. So from simple ones in which you have directed embedding layer at the beginning, starting from characters, trigrams, subwords, DPEs, and subwords, uh, LMDR. And this is a paper we wrote one year before based on a linguistically motivated vocabulary reduction. We are basically are using a morphestor, uh, so unsupervised morphology to find better uh, uh, morphing, uh, morphing boundaries inside words. Uh, we always have, let me say, for VP and LMDR, we have comparable amount of subwords in general. Uh, so we keep this comparable all over the board, uh, all across the board. And, uh, Okay, our baseline is in this red box, uh, in subwords, and you already see that this LMDR does a better job in general. Uh, and uh, we tried in this compositional approach by using trigrams, uh, character trigrams, uh, used to create, to generate uh, representations for subwords, for BP, or for these. Uh, uh, subwords from L LMDR, or directly the words, so the word types that serve in the text. Uh, we started also compositional uh, uh, representations from DP or from LMDR <coughs> subword. So we tried all the different combinations. So good results, starting from characters uh, with uh, small context, uh, give the best result uh, uh, with, with respect to all to all approaches. So seems to uh, be a good way to handle morphology. Uh, we tried to look, uh, it's English. So English is BP. Okay. It's look, yeah, it's always towards English. Yeah. And uh, we looked at uh, closely at the results on Italian and Turkish and looked at the blur score improvement over sentences, including singletons, so rare words or out of vocabulary words. And we see that this really contributes uh, on the improvement in performance. So our approach uh, works better on this kind of uh, uh, sentences in general. Uh, so what about uh, translating into, into rich morphology? So the idea here is to, we can apply this concept on the decoder side. So that, the, yes, please. No, no, this is the blue over the subset of the test set containing sentences uh, with out of vocabulary words uh, or singleton words. If the errors were at the site of the test method, it doesn't get any place in red. Yeah, yeah, it could have, yes, yes. So we, we, we focus on a subset of the test set which contains this phenomenon. Um, and uh, so the idea is to work from now from English to a uh, morphological rich language, no? from English to Turkish, for instance. So again, we assume to have BPE here in the source, uh, in, the in the encoder. Now let's look at what we can do in the decoder. So we can apply the idea of uh, uh, um, um, compositional representation for the input of the decoder. No? Uh, what can we do on the output of the decoder? So we extend the decoder here 
with, uh, uh, again, um, a character-based generation of uh, the target word, okay? Uh, so we, uh, we have a, let me say, now we start from a word representation and we go uh, toward a, uh, a character-based uh, uh, generation of the word. So uh, it's easier to look at the picture here of the architecture. So the input is uh, similar to the one you have seen for the encoder, no? So you have entire word that you split into characters and you uh, create a word representation uh, with a compositional uh, architecture. Uh, what you do on the output is that you have uh, this uh, vector that you usually multiply by uh, the embedding matrix, uh, output embedding, uh, and then you use it to sample from with softmax. So what we do here is that we instead use this representation to generate the word character by character. So we have, uh, uh, if you want to see, is a, is a dual step generation process. First you generate the word step by step with an autoregressive model, okay? And uh, uh, we use beam search here so that we can uh, uh, generate multiple hypotheses of words. So we take the top uh, K and then we use this top K word generated uh, to, in, uh, to inject uh, uh, then into the input of the encoder for the next step, okay? Uh, yeah, that's it, basically. So it's, it's, it's uh, we call it hierarchical uh, character-based uh, encoder. So let us see how this works, okay? Again, now uh, the same languages, but we translate from English, BPE-based uh, segmentation into uh, our language, uh, complex languages, Arabic, Czech, German, Italian, and Turkey. So we tried on the side of the decoder side, both with DPE, uh, with a character, full character-based decoder, okay? So that the resolution is at the decoder side, of course, with uh, word boundaries, and then our hierarchical base decoder. So what we see is that uh, it's not always the best solution that we provide, but it's the most consistent. So the hierarchical model is either top or second in the in the result. And uh, a major advantage is that it's faster than character-based decoding, uh, and it's more efficient than uh, uh, DPE in terms of parameters. So it has the same amount of parameters of uh, um, character-based decoding. So conclusion, uh, compositional word representation eliminates the necessity of uh, pre-segmentation, learns optimal representation for NT because it's optimized for NT. All the parameters are optimized uh, for the lost function of NT, uh, and it seems to be effective for rare unknown words. So with, uh, uh, I would say, with low-resource languages, because there you have rare, many rare and unknown words. Hierarchical character level decoding eliminates necessity of uh, target subword embedding. Uh, it's faster than character-based decoding, uh, same amount of parameters, and, uh, and can potentially also generate never, uh, over, never observed inflection. Okay, let's uh, welcome to the end of the first story. Uh, let's move to the next one. So it's transformer models for low resource training. And this is done by a colleague of mine, uh, Julian Salazar, who was a student of uh, David Chan uh, last summer at our place. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's about uh, being able to uh, get good results with transformer in a low resource setting. Uh, most of the work is done for high resource setting, but if you start using these configurations in a low resource setting, you, you start to get instability and, and, uh, and lack of convergence. Uh, and the, what they faced, I mean, they wanted to face the, I mean, the problem of how to uh, improve uh, performance, and they uh, found out that it's very important to focus on the, on the normalization aspect. So this is the transform architecture, and the, all the talk is about this. It's about layer normalization, okay? Uh, that is done in the transformer. So one. Uh, important uh, uh, aspect is uh, 
pre-normal post-norm. So the transformer uses this uh, called post-norm normalization. So in your residual uh, uh, connection, residual network uh, layers that you, that you see in the transformer, the normalization is done uh, after uh, the, uh, on top of the residual. Uh, while normalization uh, pre in the residual network original uh, um, work, normalization was done before. And, uh, and studies have been done uh, showing that uh, um, transformer can be more stable if this normalization is done uh, before uh, the sublayer sub of the network. And, uh, and this has been also implemented in, uh, in uh, toolkits and discussed. Uh, seems, again, that pre-norm allows greater depth and safety, safer training. So one, this justifies the fact that you are not using it, seems to also justify the use of, uh, uh, of warm-up in, uh, in, uh, in the transformer. So uh, before starting the real optimization, you start this warm-up phase in which you progressively increase linearly the learning rate, and then you reach a given point uh, which is uh, determined empirically, after which you do the real uh, um, learning rate. You apply the le real learning rate policy that, uh, uh, for instance, exponentially reduce the learning rate uh, going on. Uh, so this uh, warm up uh, possibly is there in order to stabilize the post norm layer normalization. That's that's the hypothesis that my colleagues make. And actually, if you look at uh, uh, experiments in which you reduce the number of warm-up steps, you see that if you uh, go beyond the given threshold here, uh, post-NOR uh, layer normalization uh, fails to converge. So uh, these are experiments done on, on, uh, on a small um, training condition, so English Wolfgang. Okay, so they thought, okay, is there a way to make post-norm uh, normalization uh, work like pre-normalization, which seems to not need the warm-up, actually? Uh, so the investigation uh, came up with uh, uh, this problem that very likely it could be that the uh, weight initialization is not really the best uh, uh, that could be done, especially the uh, attention supplier layer have uh, uh, a different uh, initialization, so they have, in general, uh, larger uh, weights uh, than the uh, feedwork sublayer, and they decided to uh, use a small image, so to initialize all the weights with uh, the, uh, on the smaller range used for uh, um, the people work network. And uh, actually, uh, by using this small init, things look much better, also with post-normalization. So no more fails and convergence uh, uh, failure and uh, results are getting better. But in general, post-norm, uh, pre-norm seems to be slightly better. So they went on by using uh, pre-normalization in the, in the rest. So uh, other aspects uh, related to uh, uh, transforming with low source. So of course, uh, you need to be careful with uh, uh, um, um, sorry, with, with uh, overfitting. So uh, you have many parameters. If you have low data, it's better to use aggressive dropout, label smoothing. Uh, other people try to uh, work with uh, reducing the parameters by uh, reducing the number of attention heads, uh, tying uh, self-attention layers, uh, using monolingual pre-training. Uh, here, the focus, again, is on normalization. OK, so starting from baseline, uh, Multiple languages, TED Talks, uh, again, similar scenario of the one I've shown before, translation into English from uh, uh, few languages, 
and uh, starting from very strong baseline. So this on the first line are published results, uh, mostly IWSLP, but not only, uh, with transformer and uh, and uh, starting from uh, let me say uh, the post norm system convention with layer norm conventional layer normalization. Uh, there were already four point blues on average. I had the published results. So we are talking about a strong baseline here. And uh, with pre-norm, there is a, a small improvement, 0.3 on average. This is just to tell that, okay, uh, we start from a good baseline. Now, what else can, can be done? So, uh, and Guyen, the student, did some work with uh, David Chang about this uh, fixed norm idea. So what's the problem? The problem is that uh, if you look at the last layer, uh, the softmax uh, layer, the softmax layer relies on uh, uh, the result of, uh, of a kernel product between uh, uh, the query vector, so the output vector from the network, and uh, each word embedding, okay? You measure the similarity between uh, the, the output uh, vector and the, and the word embedding that you uh, have. And uh, a side effect that you have is that, uh, undesired effect, is that this color product uh, can be affected not only by the cosine distance between the vectors, which is the desirable uh, uh, property that we would have, but also by the norm of the vector. And uh, while you're optimizing in translation uh, for with, with the loss function, uh, the system can, can even leverage the, the, the norm of the vector, no? So it can assign, it typically assigns longer uh, vectors to more frequent words, okay? And, uh, and if, if you have very similar, I mean, if you have semantically very similar words, so words that can occur in the same context, okay? Uh, MT can tend to favor the most frequent word because it has a, a, a longer, uh, embedding vector with a higher norm. So it would be better uh, to normalize the length of these vectors, like on the right side, so that only the distance uh, counts, okay? There is no more of these uh, uh, secondary effects due to the length of the vector. So in the example here, you have two directors of the same organization but one having uh, more frequency in the corpus, uh, and the system was basically translating uh, the, the name of uh, uh, Fausti always into Chang. This is an example taken from the paper of uh, Guillaume and Chang. So the idea here is to uh, normalize the embedding vectors, and why in this paper they were using an empirically determined uh, scaling factor G, here they make in this work, the, the scaling factor is uh, made uh, learnable uh, during the training of the network. So this uh, adjustment uh, gave uh, uh, almost half point uh, improvement uh, on uh, on this uh, on average on all these directions. Uh, another uh, idea was to uh, change the layer normalization. Uh, which is basically this uh, is based on a standard normalization, statistical normalization approach. So in which you have computed mean and, uh, and the standard deviation uh, on the top here. So by uh, inspiration of this RMS normalization that seems to be a little faster and uh, give uh, comparable results. So this, uh, this approach uh, has been now proposed by Stang and Fenrich in a paper accepted at uh, EURIPS uh, this year. Uh, so they show that this normalization, layer normalization is faster and gives the same results. Uh, uh, my colleague here proposed the scale norm, which basically takes the same fixed norm idea. So just uh, do this uh, scaling uh, uh, with this uh, G parameter that can be learned. And this is even faster than uh, RMS normalization. And, uh, and actually uh, uh, improved performance by another half point blue. So 
all these, uh, I mean, this bunch of tricks is uh, explained in this paper. At, I run my first page. And uh, so these strange three changes on the transformer uh, uh, are pre norm instead of post norm, fixed norm, fixed norm, and scale norm. Uh, the last two are really the same idea applied in different places of the network, not only on the uh, uh, output layer, but also in the other normalization layer. And this uh, gets significant improvements in, the, in this low resource setting. And uh, comparable improvement results are also in high resource settings. And it's also faster, I mean, both in training and uh, um, inference. Uh, no, I mean, the, the, okay. the cosine similarity is given by the scalar product. So the scalar product computes the cosine similarity. Uh, but if you, if you think about uh, the scalar product is basically equal to the product of the norms of the two vectors times the cosine distance. But if you take this as a, as a similarity measure, I mean, also the norm plays a role. So you want to, uh, you want to get rid of the role played by the norms of the vector. If you, if you make the norms of the vector equal, it's just the cosine, uh, the, the, the cosine that counts. So the distance, the co yeah, right. the distance so between the vectors, yes. The, the, the diagram that you have. Before, yes, yes. It sounded like the problem was that the norms are different. Yes, the correct. That this, so even in this case, uh, I mean, uh, the h is closer to this vector. But this vector wins in the scalar product. So actually, you're saying that the cosine similarity would not solve this problem? Yeah, I mean, if you normalize the if you normalize the norm, you get into this situation. Yeah. So the frequency doesn't count anymore. Uh, okay, works. Uh, and you should see that uh, in this case, uh, the winner here between these two will be positive because it's closer. So H is closer to policy, which is the right result that you want. Yes. So, so the input, the, sorry, the, the correct translation is policy in this example. And, and you see it because H here is closer to this vector in terms of cosine similarity. I mean, this angle is, yeah. So I guess my question was, if we did this way, Ah, okay, but you have to compute the, the angle, and this is exactly what we do. Right, so, so this is a faster way to kind of play this out, but you said it's equivalent. Uh, yeah, but it's equivalent. I mean, the scalar product is taken as a way to compute cosine similarity. Uh, if you take the normalization, yeah, you have extra computation. It's not faster. Uh, in fact, it is lower. You have to normalize this. Yeah, I mean, the vectors can be, the point is that in the paper, they don't, they do not only normalize this, that you can do once forever. I mean, normalizing the embedding is offline, but they normalize also H, and this is done run time, so it's a bit slower. So the gain in speeds are on the layer normalization. Instead of computing mean and standard deviation here, you compute only this uh, normalization I don't know how much faster it, but it's, it's faster, right? It's, this is the detail that, that you find in the paper. Okay, uh, so I like this work. It's a completely different site now. It's work done uh, at, uh, this year at um, Amazon. And it's about uh, integrating terminology into neural machine translation. So. You know about terminology, so you have customers that uh, uh, like machine translation, but they would like some terms to be translated in exactly the, the, their way. And, and this kind of uh, knowledge information is stored into these uh, lexica or glossaries or terminology bases in general, okay? So we work on this with Moses in the past by basically allowing to uh, insert uh, 
um, translation uh, suggestion inside the inputs of NT and basically forcing the decoder then to use these suggestions in the output, okay? Uh, how to do this with now uh, neural NT? Uh, so the scenario you see in this example is that you have some uh, uh, terminology entry like Amazon family, Amazon family. Uh, you have uh, an input and you would like that uh, Amazon family has to be translated exactly in that way. Uh, you want even, I mean, morphology typically uh, plays a role here because terminology bases keep uh, terms just in, in one uh, inflection, okay? Uh, so you want to be able to generate inflected versions and this is not easy to, to be done, no? So um, it's like having a dictionary you know, and you want to use uh, words from that dictionary but you want to be able to reflect them according to the context. Uh, so what about uh, approaches uh, to, to cope with terminology? So one is this post-processing approach uh, that has been used. So you have the input for MT, uh, you translate it and you get the translation, and then you assume you have a terminology base which tells you that uh, this packaging, uh, <coughs> packing uh, flip should be translated to this, not as a in, in, uh, in value. So you try to fix the translation with the post-processing. So you see that there is a match on the input uh, with the translation, uh, with the terminology. Uh, you apply alignment to find, uh, okay, what's the translation for this term into my outputs? And then you replace the output with the desired uh, entry of the term base. Uh, yeah, simple but prone to errors. From one side, you rely on alignment, which could be wrong. And second, uh, sometimes, I mean, you have to inflect. So if it's a plural and you have a singular in the terminology base, you are putting, you are replacing a plural with a singular, which doesn't fit with the rest. A more flexible way, although the name here is constraint, is to use a constraint search, a constraint decoding. So you tell in advance before uh, starting to translate uh, desired output terms that you would like to have. And uh, this can be done quite efficiently. I mean, the most efficient implementation of constraint search is here by Matt and uh, Post and, and David Villar. Uh, you have to keep some extra uh, bookkeeping in, uh, in the search uh, decoder, but you can uh, ensure that uh, uh, the hypothesis that you, that you generate contain uh, the uh, recommended expressions that you give an input, okay? So this is a way, I mean, elegant way to uh, force the decoder to use some of the suggested terms. You can do it for multiple terms. Uh, the way we did was instead of modifying the decoder, let's keep the network and let's try to teach to the network how to use terminology that we pass in input, okay? And we do it, uh, uh, I mean, fr from, from a, a practical uh, uh, way, what we do is that we, again, find a match uh, inside the input before giving it to the machine translation engine and, uh, and uh, annotate the input by providing the suggested translation for the input. And you see it there in blue. I tell you how we do it this in practice. And then MT is, uh, the, the conventional MT architecture, uh, the only difference is that it's trained to handle this kind of suggestion, okay? So it, it, it is trained to know how to handle suggestions and to use them. Uh, we call it learn to copy. And, uh, and basically uh, the impact here is, is on training mostly, okay? So we augment the input uh, with translation terms uh, information and we train the model to learn terminology use. And you can think about uh, how to implement this uh, simply by annotating training data. No? You annotate training data and we do it for a percentage. 10% of the training data is annotated with terminology matches. We have terminologies and we can look in the training data how often we see a match in the source and the target of our terminology base. 
And we decide to, in these cases, to annotate the input with the terminology because we know that this is going to be used in the, in the output. But it's, it means that the system is going to receive uh, during training many examples, most examples is without terminology, so it freely decides how to translate, freely I mean it has examples. Uh, and the other cases he, he gets the hints from input. So we, we find that uh, it's also useful to sometimes provide wrong examples so that the system is not going to use them. So he, the system has not always to use the terminology that we provide. So in terms of annotation, we use factors here in the input for each word that has the role of the word normal word, term, and this is the suggestion, the translation for the term, which is factor two. Okay? And factors generate embeddings that are composed with the word embedding. So we found pretty good results with this approach. We published it in Kiraya paper. Uh, so uh, by uh, using vic uh, dictionary term base, uh, we get uh, a slightly even better blur than the baseline uh, and better, much better than constrained decoding. And, uh, and in terms of speed, there is completely no, there is no overhead at the inference time. While uh, even this very efficient constrained decoder uh, has a threefold um, uh, uh, time. Uh, uh, sorry, a threefold uh, uh, cost, decoding cost with respect to time. Uh, so it it seems to be a pretty good solution and. Uh, it shows also to be good at inspecting. So here you have an example in which uh, uh, we have this terminology arrest test parameter uh, that has to be used as a as a uh, as a verb. Uh, while the constrained decoding is able to put test parameter inside, it cannot fit it with a verb. Uh, and and basically what happens is that it duplicates the term. It puts fast name inside, but it still uses uh, the verb in addition. While uh, uh, our approach uh, is able to substantially take the, su the suggestion and inflect it. Uh, of course, subword uh, decomposition plays a role in the capability of, of inflecting eh? uh, terms. Okay, so a black blocks approach to train neural MT how to use external terminology. Neural MT learns uh, the copy the behavior. What is important is that the training uh, is done on terms which are completely different from the terms in test. So it's a zero shot uh, scenario. So the test terminology is not included in the train terminology. And uh, so what I want to say is that the network learns the behavior, not the, ter the terms. Okay, this is important. Uh, so with respect to constraint decoding and post alignment it's flexible uh, in the use of terminology it is able to inflect the terms and it's more efficient there is no uh, overhead at inference time okay uh, end of the third uh, I move now to uh, yes please so, uh, so when you insert the suggestion Yes. Right. Um, does it also make sense to just add them as additional sentences to avoid subtraction as well? Uh, uh, it's an interesting uh, observation, yes. Uh, but we don't have the context, I mean, with the term, uh, the terminologies are always isolated. Uh, oh, I see. I, see. I mean, yeah. yeah. There are just phrase pairs, I mean, these, these terms. We don't have context. Okay. Uh, is it important that you have the first word there as well? Because you can also just replace it. Yes. So we try two approaches, which is uh, learn to replace and learn to. Uh, so we have, yeah, we have two two versions. One in which we replace uh, the term, uh, the source with the target, and one in which we add it. Uh, they seem to work. Comparably well. So I presented here just one of the two. Just first of all, what, what's the Please. format if you have a phrase? Uh, yeah, if, if you have a phrase, you first put the entire phrase, 
with, the, with these two uh, partners, and then you put the uh, other terms. Yeah, most of the terms are uh, made by multiple uh, terms. Yes. Uh, not really, unfortunately. I mean, it's uh, it's a matter of not easy to evaluate. So we are working on that, and we are working on uh, we are pushing more on the on the inflection side. I mean, now it's a byproduct, but we want to push on uh, on uh, controlling this a bit more. Yeah, but it definitely can do. So we have many examples, but we not we did not measure because. This would require really uh, human evaluation, and uh, it's, it's of course, if this stuff is going to be deployed one day, this test would be done, for sure. Yeah, okay, so this idea here is about uh, uh, making uh, ASR robust, uh, sorry, neural MP robust to ASR noise. Uh, work with uh, um, summer students. And uh, we want to substantially uh, have uh, uh, one MP engine that is capable to handle input, both from uh, uh, both speech input and text input, okay? So it's not that we want to have uh, a dedicated system for uh, speech recognition. We, we want to see if we are able to handle uh, both kind of input uh, optimally, I mean, with one system. Uh, we can see this as a domain mismatch, uh, and we treat it as a domain mismatch in which you, one of the two domains, let me say speech, uh, can have missing wrong punctuation, possible wrong words, missing wrong cases, broken sentences, disfluences. Uh, I mean, disfluences is the only uh, problem we don't have here because we work with TED Talks, and usually these are very well to fair speeches, so you don't have these fluences. But the other problems all, all arise. So what are previous works on speech translation? Uh, so 2007, it's fun because I think I presented this stuff exactly in this place, <laughs> in this room. Uh, it was using confusion networks as input for a statistical MP, and these could include both alternative uh, um, uh, transcription hypothesis, which, which are represented in a compact way to a confusion network, but also punctuation hypothesis. Okay, so we, we put all everything together and then let M, uh, MT, statistical MT, to find out what's the best uh, uh, configuration. Uh, further work was done in uh, trying to handle punctuation by uh, trying to uh, insert it before uh, machine translation by inserting after machine translation, by letting machine translation uh, to insert it, start from no punctuation and implicitly insert it uh, in the output. And this seems to be an, a, a good approach. So it's called implicit learning. Uh, uh, other work, uh, um, more recent uh, neural MP is to add synthetic noise in the input so to make the system more robust. And you have to carefully play with the percentage of noise, of wrong words that you put in the, in the input. Uh, but in general, no one was concerned in uh, uh, avoiding catastrophic forgetting, no? Because if you adapt to a domain, you risk to uh, forget about the original one. So here, uh, we use Amazon Transcribe as a as a ASR engine, uh, TED Talks data, which for which we have also speech, which we can automatically transcribe. Uh, our in our experimental setting, we work on Italian uh, English to Italian. We train a large uh, system using a lot of data, and uh, uh, experiment with TED Talks, for which we have all the uh, what we, all what we need. And uh, 
again, uh, we have one generic system that has to be uh, able, that must be able to to translate correct transcript and uh, automatic transcript, and uh, and we do it both with generic MT and with uh, with the domain adapted MT. Domain adapted here is, means adapted to TED talks, clean TED talks. So here we observe the uh, drop in performance when we are uh, using our generic system over noisy data. So we, we have a yeah, almost six point uh, drop. Uh, in parentheses, just I report blue score measure without punctuation in the reference and in the output, we remove punctuation. So you, you can see the, the role of punctuation here. Uh, the same happens, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the gap is even more relevant for an adaptive system. Uh, so what we want is substantially being able to keep performance, good performance on the, on the clean data and gain on the noisy data. That's our ideal goal. Uh, we, we, so we have this, uh, artificial training data that we created. So we transcribed all the uh, 500 hours of uh, uh, TED Talks available so that we create uh, um, real noisy data. And tried all the combinations between uh, training with clean transcript, with punctuation, without punctuation, and clean no punctuation, uh, ASR transcript with punctuation, ASR transcript without punctuation. So uh, uh, the important concept here is that we do uh, this adaptation uh, by balancing uh, clean and noisy data. And this approach uh, allows you to, uh, I mean, the hypothesis is that it allows you to improve over noisy data without forgetting how to translate well clean data. So let's see how our approach works if you train on uh, uh, only one condition, single condition. So we, if we train on uh, clean data with and without punctuation, uh, uh, okay, we have the performance that I showed before, but if we go to noisy data, we have this drop. If we train on noisy data, uh, we adapt on noisy data, we uh, lose one point almost on clean data and we significantly boost uh, performance on uh, uh, on the noisy set, okay? So, yeah, so more or less uh, that's what I want to say. If you if you combine the, condi the, the conditions in fine tuning, so you still, uh, you add noisy data, but also clean data in a balanced way, you achieve the goal because you, you can even gain a little bit for the clean data uh, but are able to uh, and maintain the advantage, I mean, the, the gain on the noisy data, okay? So this comes really just from uh, fine tuning uh, over both conditions. So no catastrophic forgetting. So we did some manual evaluation and, uh, and found out that uh, the improvement over noisy data is statistically significant. So if we, if we rank translations, basically, uh, our uh, robust system uh, is twice as better in, uh, um, uh, with respect to uh, noisy data, okay? So, um, I mean, the number of wins is basically twice as much as uh, the one for the clean, uh, the, the system, the conventional system trained on clean data. So uh, what errors are recovered? So not uh, many, as you can imagine. Uh, so most of the uh, errors that are recovered over short words, frequent words, where also many errors happen actually. But here are examples. Uh, and uh, of course, the system is not able to recover uh, errors like this. Uh, wearable robot with rec and row ball. Uh, um, so, as a, as, a, as a thought, maybe it's not even a good idea to train a system with this kind of noise. 
That's just a, an insight. So this is something they're going, they are looking at now. Uh, conclusions, uh, uh, yeah, we can increase robustness and without catastrophic forgetting. Okay, last, uh, uh, last talk is uh, related to the previous one because we want to use uh, machine translation uh, for speech uh, translation. And one of the issues that for given applications, you would like to have a control of the output plane. Uh, think about subtitles, for instance. If you translate uh, speech to create subtitles, uh, subtitles uh, must fit uh, some uh, uh, space constraints. And you would also prefer short translations for the sake of readability. Uh, so the idea is that you might have a layout that you want to preserve. So think about even document translation. You translate a slide, and the translation of a bullet point should fit the space of the, the original space. You don't want to break the layout, no? In general, of documents. So if you take that sentence, uh, you see Google Translate uh, produces a longer translation. Our system two and our enhanced system, the one that we work here, is able to produce a, a translation which is closer in, uh, in uh, length uh, to the to the original one and could fit, for instance, with uh, uh, space. Okay, so that's the whole thing. Having one, you want to have translations that are able to fit some uh, constraints. It can be space constraints, but also timing constraints. So uh, if you look at uh, control of the length, I mean, the basic stuff is really uh, this length penalty that you have in the, in the, um, and neural MP beam search systems uh, together with coverage penalty. Uh, what we worked on is uh, two approaches. One is the length token. Uh, so we condition the output to a given length ratio class. So we tell the system produce a short translation, produce a long translation. Or this length encoding, we enhance the position encoding of the transformer with information about the uh, length of the output. We see this in a moment. So, how does length encoding, uh, length token work? Let's see in training. Okay. So the idea is very simple. We measure the uh, target source length ratio measured by characters, not words. Okay, over our training data, and we uh, we split the data into three categories. Okay. So. Uh, you see the length ratio down. 1.0 means the target has the same length in character of the source. Okay, so we we find these three classes and basically partition the training data and uh, uh, and add a token to each uh, training uh, item, uh, specifying the class where it comes from. So, so this is an example which is long. Okay, it's a long translation. So we train the system with, uh, with uh, uh, sentence pair enhanced with these tags. This is a short example, and this is a norm example. Okay? Uh, very simple. Uh, when, uh, uh, when we train our system, we start from a, a high-end normal system, I mean, uh, uh, without this enhancement. And then we fine tune the system over this uh, uh, partition of data so the system starts to use this token, okay, uh, length token. At inference time, at inference time, uh, we have the advantage that we provide some input and you can ask for a short translation, for a normal translation, and for a uh, uh, long translation, okay? So, what does the system learn? If the system learns, uh, I would say, a translation style, okay? Uh, the training data that we're using is made from human uh, by human translators. And human translators are different. There are translators that are able to prefer shorter translation, others don't care, produce longer translation, or they could have followed different uh, 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 recommendations. 
but actually you find this data inside. And, and the system learns translation patterns of, for these categories in general. Okay, the second approach is this position encoding. Here's a brief recap about uh, the uh, position encoding of the transformer, which uses this uh, sine and cosine encoding. Uh, so what we do is we add other encodings, which uh, instead of telling the position of the input uh, from, this, from the begin, we, we provide information about the length of the translation. And the training time, we know the length of the translation. So on the decoder side, we enrich this positional encoding with information that tells word by word uh, what is the position of this word in terms of uh, characters with res uh, to the end, with respect to the end. So how many characters are there until the end of the translation? Okay, so we make the, the system aware about uh, uh, how much uh, characters it can use in the, in the translation. Uh, we have both an absolute position, len minus pos, and a relative position, pos uh, over len. So you are at 75% uh, of the translation. So at, at, yeah. so at inference time, we can basically tell the system, okay, to the decoder, okay, generate a translation of uh, 200 characters. Uh, of course, uh, it, it, it works to some extent, but we cannot think that uh, bec because we provide this information, the transformer is now triggering uh, a, a planning strategy in the translation. It's not doing that. So we have to do some fixes here. So one is that we are using, uh, it seems to be better to use uh, quantization. So just use uh, four quantiles for the relative position, so to tell, okay, this is the first 25%, this is the second 25%, this is the third, and this is the last 25%. And what actually happens is that uh, when you tell, okay, you are in the last 25%, it tends to stop after a while, so it, okay? You, it's more stable in the sense that it can produce translations uh, that fit very well the constraint, but it risks to skip some information. Uh, so how do they work? In terms of length ratio, uh, we look at short translations here. Uh, so the normal, the standard is 1.05. This is the uh, length ratio. Output is generally 5% longer. So with penalty by playing, fiddling, we arrive, to, we can use, just to use by 1% without impacting on uh, blue score. Uh, uh, with our LAN token, we arrive to 1%. So reducing 5% seems uh, easy, but it's not easy. Uh, if we combine both LAN token and, uh, and LAN encoding, we can go down to 96%. Uh, it's harsher, but we get a bit more loss in blue. And the same is for German, I mean, similar pattern. Uh, if you look at blue scores, here we we, of course, uh, we are generating shorter translations, so we don't want the length penalty play a role. So this is blue without length penalty. So uh, in terms of precision, we are quite good here. Uh, and, and, and yeah, the, the length token uh, in, uh, in Italian, uh, English Italian uh, gives even better performance in terms of precision. But yeah, the, the, the loss is uh, relatively uh, low. So of course we don't have ideal references and we use human references, sorry, we use human evaluation. And on Italian, uh, uh, English Italian, we ask human evaluators to, to tell us if the translations are really equivalent, the short translations are really equivalent to the reference. So it's a very harsh uh, evaluation and we found out that uh, there was a degradation in only 4% of the, of the translations of our test set. So it's, uh, I'm happy with that, I must say, because uh, if you have these constraints, you cannot, uh, I mean, you, you might allow for some uh, words to be dropped if they're not relevant. So uh, 
I did some analysis on the, what, the, what the system learned about in terms of uh, strategies to generate uh, shorter translations. So the, the system here in these examples shows that it learned to paraphrase in, with less words. Like, and we uh, uh, people on, in the in the West, uh, in with in the West, uh, and you don't lose anything because the pronoun is duplicated in the verb, so it's redundant. Yeah. So these are really equivalent translations, okay? But they are only shorter. Uh, uh, some unnecessary words are dropped, like uh, uh, this uh, uh, pronoun. Uh, in red, okay, or this adverb. So if you drop an adverb, uh, like really, this is, this is really. You don't change the, the sentence, but you, you make it shorter. Uh, and then on verbs. So it tends to prefer, it tends to prefer uh, uh, simple tenses towards compound tenses, uh, which it's okay, I mean. Uh, is not is not a big deal. So um, I like this very much because uh, it, it makes sense. So it really learns st uh, stylistic choices from the data, and I think this idea could be applied to other uh, style uh, stylistic problems. So conclusion: length token allows code change control over the length without deprivation in quality. This length encoding guarantees you more control. I mean, with, with the token, it might happen that the transition is not getting shorter. The system is probably not able to find the right changes on the, on the, on the stylistic changes. While this guy here, uh, <laughs> if you tell him stop, it stops in the sense that it's going to uh, even break the translation. I mean, in general, it's, it's, it's better than uh, uh, just breaking because you see the degradation in blue is very marginal. It's not... Uh, that's important. Okay, that, that finishes my presentation. Uh, almost in time. <laughs> Summarize why you maybe ask questions. Yes, I, I can see if I had questions during the talk, but if you have maybe another short question. No, it seems that it's better to drop it, uh, and uh, it's better to use implicit learning. So we found out. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate, I mean, if you take speech recognition translation, it can really break the, the, the syntax, the, the, the flow of the discourse. So uh, and it's better to, we, we see better results by training the system to work without punctuation. Maybe if you replace punctuation with, with more fuzzy information like uh, poses, etc., it could be better. On the source, we drop it on, on the source. So NeuralMP is able to insert punctuation in the target. So it's implicit learning from the parallel data. Thank you. Uh, okay, just IWCLP, we have nice challenges. I already talked to interested people. Please participate. Uh, so we have offline uh, speech translation, simultaneous translation, conversational speech, open domain, and uh, non native. And these are organized by uh, friends here. And uh, if you are interested in summer internships, uh, Drop an email to Yasser here. Um, we have openings. Okay.